What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of Clay and Kateri Takes on the World. Uh, in this episode, I am humbly uh, joined by the great Mark Wooding, uh, creator of After School. And yeah, I mean, probably someone who needs no introduction other than that. Uh, Mark, how you doing, man? Oh, thanks. Well, <clears throat> I'm pretty anonymous, so... I don't think anybody really knows who I am out there, so I, I might I might need an intro. Uh, that is that is <laughs> no, true. Kidding. No, but I know what you're saying, right? Like yeah. I, a lot of your stuff is just kind of like under the after school name, and I think I saw recently you posted on your story. Someone like wanted you to like sign their uh, sign like an artwork that you did for them, and I saw you wrote after school, and I was thinking about that. I was like, I wonder why he like I wasn't sure if there was like a reason you were kind of like trying to keep your name like out of it, or if it was just like uh, it just happened that way. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I don't know. I've always been like more of a behind the scenes person and I just went with after school and that name is like recognizable and you know, nobody would recognize my name and I don't put my face or my voice on the channel. So um whenever somebody does give me a shout out and they say my name, everybody's like, Okay, who who's that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> well that, let's fill them in a little bit. I mean, first of all, don't cl go click it yet, but in the description below I'll have Mark's uh, stuff linked. But after school is essentially and I'll give it my perspective. This is essentially a YouTube channel and Instagram super good. I, I love the Instagram as well. Um, but the YouTube channel kind of goes into these like super deep metaphysical ideas of psychology um, and otherworldly ideas. And then Mark is just an expert whiteboard uh, designer. And so then he kind of just draws on the whiteboard to what you know, great thinkers of our generation uh, speak about from Eckhart Tolle to <laughs> the great thinker of Joe Rogan to um, Jordan Peterson, and the list goes on and on. And man, I'll, I mean, I'll be honest, like I've, I've like dabbled in your stuff every now and then. And then I think just recently, like within the last year or two, it's like really like kind of connected. Mm. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah. I, so like I, I said, I have kept my name pretty separate, but I, I'm not like ashamed if anybody you know, attaches my name to after school. I'm not going to be like, no, that's, that's not me. I'm like Banksy or something. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm definitely proud of it. I've just, I always wanted it after school to be about the ideas and, and I wanted the ideas to kind of stand on their own. And, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not perfect. And people could say, Hey, why'd you make a video about veganism when I, you just ate a chicken wing last week? Yeah. You know, <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's very much like if you're in a glass house, you don't throw stones. So I really, you know, ideas are, are sacred and I, I'm, I'm not making this, these videos for anybody in particular. I'm kind of just exploring them on, on my own and it's like my own evolution, my own like diary. And I'm, it's really like the ultimate selfishness. Like I'm just doing this for myself because I'm super curious and then sharing them with the world and hopefully it resonates. And the ironic thing is when I, when I kind of changed my mindset, like I, in the beginning I was very much making videos to please other people. And I was like chasing views. And then I kind of had like a paradigm shift and I was like, you know what, like make videos for yourself. And if you get no views, you still got a lot out of it. You know, you learned a ton. Yeah. And when, once I did that, I feel like it, it actually changed the tone of, of the channel. It wasn't really for like kids or teens anymore. It was very much like adult themes presented in like kind of a very approachable way. So yeah. Right. It was like a more, I don't want to call it childish, right? But it's like these very big ideas, like with like a kind of a cartoonish underlay onto them a little bit. Mm -hmm. And it's really cool how you kind of like laid out that you just, yeah, I, I guess it resonated with me whenever you were saying about how you kind of wanted to keep your name out of it to, uh, it, it, well, I guess it wasn't too, but it was kind of just to like let it stand on its own, to kind of just like let this stuff, you know, it, take it for what it is and don't have that attachment to it. Because like you said, I mean, these ideas, I guess, are something that, you know, I, I think everybody in the world should follow your channel. <laughs> um, <laughs> but with that being said, you know, it's like, these are ideas that we kind of all can relate to and talk about, but then, you know, you don't want to attach that name to it because then people maybe in your close inner circle would be like, would have more to say about it per se. Does that make sense? Mm. <clears throat> Yeah, there, there was a time period where I, I was thinking about stepping in front of the, the camera myself. It's definitely not my strong point, but I was like, you know, you, you can't just hide forever kind of thing. But maybe you can, because with this whole, like, cancel culture stuff, like, 
honestly, I'm, I'm happy that I'm, I'm separated. And a lot of other YouTubers and creators are saying that you were smart to like kind of lay low. And so now I'm kind of sitting back, like enjoying my, my behind the mask type of deal. And, yeah. um, I really see no, no need to step in front of the camera unless it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, it's absolutely like important or like, you know, do or die, I guess, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Do you do you do any of the voiceovers? Not really. Like maybe no. I'll do a little sponsor thing, but it's it's my friend. Oh, okay. all voice. Yeah. Oh, you see so you even outsource the voices as well. I mean, I can't stand from... the sound of my own voice. No, <laughs> like, I probably won't listen to this podcast. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. All right. I won't yeah. take it personally. <laughs> yeah. But I'll share it around, though. I <laughs> uh, appreciate it, man. Um, yeah. So let's get, let's get into it. So did you, what was the first thing you wanted to be whenever you grew up? Did you always kind of have like this artistic drive or was our being an artist kind of off the map? Well, my, I, I was lucky and blessed that I had parents that were really encouraging and they were, they gave me a pen before I could even walk. So I'd like waddle over before I could even crawl and, and I would hold the pen in a fist and I would draw, um, just, doodles or whatever and i ended up holding the pen like a fist up until like deep into like elementary school and the teachers were constantly trying to like grind that out of me yeah and so i was left-handed i held my my pen really weird and i didn't know that i was like good at art at all until my parents put, entered one of my drawings or paintings into this big art contest and it, it won and i was only five years old and I'm sitting there in, in class and I get a trophy that's like a foot taller than me. <laughs> and that was kind of like the first validation, I guess, that, oh, wow, I guess this could be my thing, you know. And so I yeah. kept um, doing art. And then I um, eventually in high school, I started painting on Vans shoes uh, for the my fellow students. And somehow that kind of got around my my community and my local newspaper did a big story on it, the San Francisco Chronicle. And okay. then that Chronicle article led to tons of people wanting shoes. And I'm just like, okay, could this be my career? Just doing like, if I could do three shoes a day and charge yeah. like $50 a day or $50 a pair. And uh, that article led to a couple other cool opportunities. Um, I ended up working for a bag company called Timbuk2. They make like biker bags made out of canvas. And I would paint on those and I helped them design some, some bags. <clears throat> and... Uh, eventually, I started recording myself uh, create the shoes and create little paintings. I'd have a camera above me, and that's kind of where the whole recording yourself draw started, and then I'd speed it up. I think one of the first paintings I ever did was of Snoop Dogg, and I did it to his song, Nothing But a G Thing, hey. and put that on the internet. And I just really enjoyed, like, a lot of the art that I created was not very permanent because people would take those shoes and then run in the mud. And, you know, two months later, that painting would be really messed up. But what would live on would be the video. So mm -hmm. I always got really into, like, time-lapse videos. And um, I got asked to do, like, various little murals. And a lot of times the murals would be in chalk. It would be, like, a Trader Joe's type mural. And uh, okay. So even that know, would kind of wash away. <laughs> yeah, if you're doing something in a, in a non-permanent medium, who know, that might last only a few hours. So okay. I'd go to, like, conferences, and I'd be the artist at a conference, and I'd draw themes that they wanted, but I'd always have a camera rolling. And so the video would kind of, it would live on and then it would also promote itself and it would lead to more opportunities. And, uh, after college, I, I got a job at a uh, medical center and, uh, my task was to create a course for veterans to help them cope with PTSD. Okay. And so I was working with psychologists and my job was to kind of put the course together and make it look good. And I thought, you know what, maybe I, I think the whiteboard animation style had just started during that time. Okay. And so I thought, you know, let me try this out, you know, just how I've recorded all the other things. And the, the veterans responded really well to it. They, they loved it. The, the class engagement went up. So I got asked to do all sorts of weird little topics. And the videos kind of just promoted themselves. And I soon before I knew it, I had like a line of customers who wanted videos. And I didn't even know what I could charge for it. I'm like, you guys want to pay me to make little doodles? All right. <laughs> and um, long story short, eventually I got burnt out on just doing videos for other people. I was full of ideas and I really admired YouTubers, just the freedom of that lifestyle to kind of like explore a topic. Sure. 
And so I looked up to a few channels and I was like, you know, I could probably do this. So I really looked to a couple of channels and I was like, okay, what are they doing? Like how often are they uploading? How long are their videos? Like what's the content? And that's kind of how I started after school uh, for a number of reasons. I had a big setback in business that caused me to one door shut. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to completely, I am going to do this YouTube thing and I'm not going to care if I don't make any money. Open the so other gave, door. Yeah. I gave myself one year to get a hundred thousand subscribers. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty hard in the beginning cause you're making, you're spending all this time and effort and you put a video out and like, it gets no views and you're kind of just like, am I really going to do this again? <laughs> you know? But I, I made this commitment to do it for a year. Yeah. So I'm six months into the year. My goal is a hundred thousand subscribers and I'm not even to a thousand yet. I'm six months in. So I'm like, I'm not even 1% of the way to my goal and the year's half over. So and did you I like really switch like, something up then at that point? I was questioning it. And then I was like, you know what? You said you were going to do a year, just hit the year. And so, <clears throat> um, eventually I had one video get some traction. It was, um, it got some hate, but you kind of need to get some hate to, in order to get, get any attention. Yeah. You can't was, like have everyone happy kind of deal. Right. So I did a video about, um, why the millennials do so poorly in the workforce. I think I've probably seen it. <laughs> yeah. That was my first video that started generating some traction and the guy who, who spoke the words, uh, Simon Sinek, he shared the video everywhere and that helped a lot. <clears throat> so that was the video, the first experience in like the power of the internet, just when an algorithm will push your video, it, like I could, I used to go on the street and try to get people to like sign up for my YouTube channel. On the <laughs> really? <street. laughs> like I would go around Wait, the library. Tell me about that. That's hilarious. I mean, yeah. So know, it's, it's fascinating, but funny. I at would the same pester. Time. I'd go to the soccer field and I'd get every soccer guy to get your phone out. I I had a party at my <laughs> house with like eighty people, and in order to enter the party, you had to get your phone out and go on Google. And if you didn't no, go, that's like, awesome. You know, I don't have a half the people were like, I don't have a Gmail account. I'm like. We'll make one right now. If you want to get in, like, so, That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. But you know, you can do that all day and maybe get like maybe 50 subs. Yeah. But the truth is you kind of have to do that in the beginning. You have to like have no shame and promote yourself in the beginning because if you don't, nobody else is. Yeah. You, have you just to, have like, that constant, just outputting it out there kind of thing. Yeah. And I meet a lot of creators who are like, they're, they're humble, which is great. And you should definitely do that. And they're like, no, no, I don't want to like share this with anybody. I'm like, well, if you don't want to share it, like right. who else is? Right. Why would anybody else? Yeah. Yeah. It starts with you kind of thing. So yeah, I would, I would like bother people on the street. I would go up to like, after a bar, people would be in line to get pizza and there'd be a line of like 30 people. And I'd be like trying to get them all to subscribe, <laughs> you know, like, like one of those rappers trying to sell your CD on the yeah. street. But once that video finally hit the algorithm, just the, the subscribers just started pouring in and I was like, Oh wow, this is like, if I hired a hundred people to do what I was doing on the street and they're all right. working for me for free. Right. <clears throat> so that was my first, um, hit. And then I tried to replicate that same success. So I did a video with Joe Rogan and that kind of Joe Rogan was nice enough to tweet it out and that did really well. And, um, the, then the, the big video that really just launched everything was, um, Oddly enough, a video called uh, Why Don't Country Flags Use the Color Purple? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a topic that I, you know, I barely thought twice about. And I was just looking at some flags and I was like, huh, all right. And I wrote the question down and the answer was pretty weird. Right. And if you're, you know, if your listeners want to know the answer, I would say, go check out the video. Yeah. And we're not going <laughs> to give it all here. <laughs> Everybody's like, well, what's the answer? I'm like, go, if only there was a video. <laughs> 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 Probably one say, someone made a whiteboard video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that got 10 million views and it was just like screaming. I think it got on the trending page probably. And nice. Congrats. That got me like a hundred thousand subscribers in a week. That's crazy. Just like, And I'm sure like and, an element of it is like they find that video and then it's like, all right, what else does this guy have? And since you had these like six, eight months of like, you know, back end it's like you, people just sit there and just get consumed at least i'm speaking for myself at least where then you just start getting consumed by all this stuff it's like oh that's an interesting question that's an interesting question like you know why is this why is that and then you fall down this rabbit hole that's totally true because 
um, all those videos that I had put out before that got zero views, they also started getting traction. So it's kind of like this trifecta of all these things going off at once. And then I, it was like, it was like holding on to like a rocket chair and you're just like, <laughs> it's working. When's it going to stop? <laughs> <clears throat> so things were going great in the beginning of YouTube. I thought I was like the golden boy of YouTube for a bit and I had figured everything out, but then the algorithm, it was kind of like a, a wave or a tornado or tornado that went by and just as quickly as it came, it, it quickly left. And I kind of was sitting there figuring out, I was doing the same thing over and over again. And those, those videos were no longer getting views. And I was like, huh, you know, I was kind of chasing those same little cute sciencey videos, which, which are cool. But, uh, I, I kept putting out more and more of those little science videos and they weren't hitting so I was like, all right, let's go back to the drawing board. And when and you say science, time, when you say science, is it more like physics based kind of stuff? Trying to answer little questions in two minutes. Like what happens when you drink seawater? Why does okay. February have 28 days? Little questions that you kind of wonder about, you know? Right. That someone <laughs> might just mindlessly just type into Google and just be right. like, oh, uh, like, yeah. Why is the sky blue kind of thing? Right. Okay. And so then... So then did the algorithm change or did just, is there like something event that occurred that all that just stopped or did you kind of, did, did you think just humanity? Well, YouTube changed big time on the back end because there was all these, uh, um, I guess you could call them evil or perverted dudes or perverted people going on YouTube and posting things that were like SpongeBob SquarePants, but then there'd be all this weird perverted stuff in them. Oh, so I remember that. I remember that happening. So yeah. all these kids were seeing really disturbing things. And so YouTube found this out and then they said, okay, we're going to have to make YouTube safe for kids. <clears throat> so you had to decide, are you making content for kids or not? And there was like a clear line. And I decided um, you had to jump through a lot of loopholes to, to be uh, accredited for kids content. And I was like, you know, I want my stuff to be for everybody. I don't want to just limit myself. So I kind of, there was so much more freedom in making content for, um, 13 and older, mm -hmm. or maybe I, I don't know what the age was, but I just chose, okay, I'm not making content for kids. So in that moment, I, I was kind of pushed to just say, all right, I'm, I'm making content for people like me. And so there was a big change. And then I started making videos about psychedelics and philosophy and um, Jordan Peterson type stuff. When, when you did that, you kind of saw the, the rocket ship take back off again. It didn't take, take off, but I kind of built a different type of audience. It, instead of people randomly finding my channel, it started to become more like people tuning in every, every two weeks. Right. To finally yeah. have more like deeper intellectual um, type conversation. <clears throat> yeah. I wasn't doing two minute videos anymore. I started making them a lot longer, like 10 minutes plus because you can't, you can't get too deep in, in two minutes. Right. And, um, people don't want to watch like an hour long video. Maybe they'll, they'll sit down for an hour long podcast, but, um, the sweet spot has been eight minutes to 15 minutes in video length. Eight to 15. I guess that's what you found with like YouTube then. Yeah, but I've been going longer and longer and getting better results. So I've been, you know, obviously if you do a longer video, that's more work for me. So right. a 20 minute video could be like three separate videos. But right, because then you, you, I mean, you have to draw the whiteboard for this um, kind of stuff, right? Which yeah, I found out, I thought, <laughs> and I remember my first call, I was like, yeah, I just imagine your entire room is just like one like circular whiteboard <laughs> where you just kind of sit in a circle and just like keep going around. But you're saying that you only have one whiteboard um, that you use for all of this. Yeah, the whiteboard's behind me. Um, for the listeners out there, it's it's only like four four feet wide. So I kind of draw things frame by frame and then move them along. Uh, so you're you're really the only video you're actually seeing is the short video of me drawing, and then that kind of turns into a photo and then moves to the side. Yeah, and you kind of just keep going down the the length of it. Yes, that's cool though. I think it's really fascinating how you've kind of always had this like artistic, uh, you know, thing throughout 
it sounds like that you've had this throughout your entire life, like even starting when you were drawing before you could even walk kind of thing. Um, and so then you were saying that I think there was like the art contest. That was the first time that you were like, oh, like I could do this for a living. Kind of. It, it was weird, though, because I, I did go to I did major in art in college and I didn't I never felt like an artist. I never really uh, fit in with the other artists. I found them to be very weird and, and fringe. And I, I don't know, I just didn't relate to like they they take a drop of blood and like drop it on a canvas and then that would be their art. And I'm like, um, huh? <laughs> like I, I like paintings, like Lord of the Rings style paintings and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I never really fit in with the art, other art majors. And I, I guess my dream was always to have my art in front of a lot of people and have a big impact. Uh, growing up, one thing that I was really, I wasn't a very good student, but the one subject that I really loved was show and tell. And I would okay. focus like all week on like making a really good show and tell presentation. And again, it wouldn't be me like speaking. I'd be doing like a science experiment and Perfect. I'd blow the kids away. I'd have like flames going in the class and the teacher would be like worried that I was going to blow up the classroom. <laughs> the kids were like really enthusiastic about it. So I guess that's, that's awesome. where that kind of like presentation style every week came from. And it sounds like you've, you found that like perfect thing where you have your art, you have your presentation style. And then, you know, from the, from the drawings, you kind of did like the stop motion. Mm -hmm. So you kind of found that whole like <clears throat> thing kind of come together. Yeah. I used to write a lot of the scripts. I, I used to write over half the scripts myself and that was a lot of work. And the funny thing is when you're trying to be this like dispenser of knowledge, you always feel like a fraud mm -hmm. and then people comment on it and they're like, you know, this fact's wrong and this fact's wrong. And you kind of, if you, if you try to act smart, you're always in fear that you're going to be exposed for being dumb. Mm, so, yeah, I, I started doing more speeches of other people that I looked up to. And at first I was kind of taking their speeches and then repurposing them. And I'd ask for, for permission. And of course they'd always say yes. I mean, who doesn't want their words right. to be honored by art? Right. Um, uh, Surprisingly, a couple of people have said no, and I'm like, huh? But it's always some weird legal <laughs> issue. Uh, okay. Um, the worst is when you make an entire video and then they say no when you're done. You're like, uh, um, <laughs> okay, all that work is wasted. How many times have you that's made that mistake? <laughs> <laughs> that's only happened once. Okay. That's only happened once, and I was that's just a, like, that's a good number shocked. of times. Yeah. <laughs> but that was a lot of work. For, was it like just a piece down. of it, or was it like the entire content, the entire subject? The the whole video was flagged for a copyright and can and I'm still oh. I'm still hopeful that it'll get reversed because it was just a long story and I think there was some confusion on what I was trying to do and like I asked for permission and I didn't hear back and I asked for permission over like the course of six months and I didn't hear back and this person didn't even have their own YouTube channel so I'm like they probably don't even go on YouTube right so I figured. And, and this clip was already all over YouTube. So I figured, okay, it's already on YouTube. They don't have their own channel. They don't have the time to even answer emails. So it might be okay. And then the video went pretty, it was get, got 500,000 views in like a week or so. And then I got the flag. Interesting. So, yeah, yeah. So do you need to usually, cause I mean, now you do um, use like other people's speeches or stuff on their podcast. Do you, now need to have, like you get permission from them and then whenever you upload it do you like tell youtube hey i have permission from this person to post this audio clip well the the greatest thing now is people are coming to me uh, and asking me to animate the things so i have like a list of people who are saying can you animate this podcast or can you animate and so i i don't even have to like look at things look for things anymore um and now they're even writing custom scripts for the channel. Like um, last week, Graham Hancock, one of my favorite authors, someone I've really looked up to over the years, he wrote a custom script just for after school. And it was kind of surreal because I met Graham Hancock five years ago and I was really excited to meet him. And I remember I told him I was starting a YouTube channel and he was very encouraging. And it just tripped me out because here we are five years later and he's writing a custom script for after school and he's in the video. And he's saying how great after school is. And I'm just like, my mind is blown. Like, damn, you know, 
that's like when it comes full circle kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You're just like, shit, like it's happening. And Jordan Peterson too. He's someone that I've listened to since like 2017. And, um, at first I, I, I probably found out about him in a similar way that most people did from the controversial, um, bill that was trying to be passed in Canada. And then they were trying to like smear him on, on the news and whatever. And I said, who is this guy? The and video, I, I remember the video on, was it like the five or something with that lady? And she's like, oh, so what you're saying is. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> it's so that funny. Was great. <laughs> so funny. He's just like, where, he's like, are we even in the same room? <laughs> like <laughs> what's going on here? That was a wild interview. And I think a lot of yeah. people found his lectures through that. And I got really deep into all his lectures and it really helped orient me in the world. For sure. So. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely relate. I remember, uh, I remember at one of my jobs, I would like listen to his entire like maps of meaning. Uh, are you, you're familiar with that? Like mm-hmm. his whole like a diagnosis of like the Pinocchio like story. I just remember like, cause I was like, a soft, <clears throat> excuse me, I was a software engineer. I just listened to that on like every single episode. It probably took like two weeks or a week or something to listen to all of it. But it was like fascinating. Like the way he just like depicts like everything in there. Oh yeah. I love how he, he takes stories that we all know and love and he'll just break it down and and the themes and the archetypes and, and the real meaning behind everything. You don't really think about how deep it is. Right. And I think, I think something that really got me like a a point I really remember is he was talking about how, you know, back in what had been like the 1930s or forties, um, whenever they were creating like Pinocchio or like any of these things, they had to like create, and this might be right up your alley. They had to create like the individual frame by frame, like image of all of the things. And I remember him pointing out, like, none of this is in here by accident. Like they had to lay out every single frame and do like a whole painting of it. Like, you know, to make this, you know, thing a reality. Yeah. I I remember he did an episode on Lion King, which is probably my favorite kids movie. And Lion King has such deep themes in it and Jordan Peterson went through all those incredible themes and uh I, I realized how how impactful that movie was on my life so then I watched the remake of it and it was completely lacking in in a lot of the emotion and subtle expression in the drawings and uh I don't know if you watched the remake of Lion King but it just like doesn't hit because was the it the animals, real life one yeah the animals are like so realistic that they can't show any expression so it's just like you have a voice coming out of like a bird and the bird's beak is just going up and down but you don't get like the zazu you know all those emotions and expressions are completely right. missing. or like yeah. the animation like whenever you see somebody moving like if you're watching this on youtube versus listening to the audio it's going to hit different just because you can see facial expressions tonality you know hand mm-hmm. the hand gestures i'm doing right now um yeah but i think I, I, first of all, I think I need to go back and find that, uh, his diagnosis of the Lion King, because I haven't seen that one. Um, but yeah, I do know, I think I know what you're talking about. And it's just like, yeah, the, the CGI, it's like, they like try to be too real about it almost. And it's just like bland versus, um, like the birds like dancing around and stuff. Right. Yeah. So, so then to get back to the story, did he reach out to you to do like a, a script of his? Uh, so the first time I did a video of Jordan, it was um, kind of under the radar, and he was nice enough to share it around. <clears throat> and then I got contacted by some of his team, and they were saying they were going to put together a course, and they wanted me to animate 100 of his videos. Jeez. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't know if I can commit to that, but that's that's quite an honor. And this was a few years ago, and then he got really sick, and then that project kind of evaporated. Um. But he's always been really encouraging to me and I've never met him in person, but every online interaction I've had with him has been really nice. And he's just, you know, he's, he's totally real. Yeah. He's one of the most encouraging wise people I've come across. That's awesome. Like he's, yeah. he is who he is. He got, he's not like, you know, it, I, <laughs> if you've seen enough of his videos, you know how he is and it's kind of, yeah. like you get that same vibe from him online as well. Yeah. And, and I see a lot of hate going his way. Like there's a really common comment that I see on every video of people try to decredit the message by 
saying something bad about the person and then they can kind of dismiss all the content of the message. So, right. you know, Jordan Peterson has had his issues with uh, going to rehab and his health issues. And, you know, very common comment you see is, why would I take advice from somebody who's depressed? Or why would I take advice from an addict? And I don't know, it's, it seems like people that are able to explore like their dark side are able to kind of extract ideas and, and express things that people who can't um, cannot do. So I'm thinking of like Lincoln Park, uh, Chester Bennington. Okay. You know, now when I go back and listen to old Lincoln Park songs, it really hits differently. I'm like, wow, he really pulled these lyrics out from a dark, dark place. I was watching uh, Anthony Bourdain last night, uh, Parts Unknown. And he's, I never realized how awesome that show was. It's kind of like a show you have in the background where you're cooking or something. Okay. But I really watched it and he he's very he's got some very dark moments but it, he's able to extract some really beautiful rays of sunlight through these dark moments and it makes the show so much deeper so and, yeah, yeah another person that comes to mind is uh Kanye West um <clears throat> he have you ever seen his like TMZ rant I think so yeah, yeah where he's like it, it you, it's so bizarre cuz you watch it and you're like I remember the first time I watched it, I was like, all right, he's just a little like off his rocker. But then I came back like a year, I think a year or two later. And I'm like, oh, damn, like there's some profound knowledge in like what this guy is saying. And I found it very, and I remember sharing it with a couple people. And I, it, the, the response was very similar to what you're talking about, where it's like, yeah, that there's truth in that message, but Kanye West is saying it. Therefore, I discredit it, you know, so therefore I don't like uh, take it in or try to reason with it. It's almost like there's this, how would you describe it? Like there's this thought process that it, I guess it comes back to cancel culture almost where it's like, if you've done one thing wrong, it's like, okay, let's just throw you out. You have no use to society. And it's mm -hmm. like, and it's kind of crazy to think that too, because like even in the legal system if you kill somebody you still like have a chance like you know you, it's 25 to life so you can still get out in, mm. in theory in 25 years so even if you've killed someone we still in our legal system say well you still have a chance at redemption yeah dave Chappelle just mentioned that in his recent special did you see it no i haven't um, seen it i think it's called the closer it's been okay. a focal point of the the news for like the last couple of weeks I've been surprised at how long they've been focusing on this. There must not be much else going on. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they mentioned the there, was a, there was a rapper who murdered somebody in like broad daylight in a Walmart. And nobody really cares about that. But he said something homophobic and now they want to cancel him. And this is the rapper or David Chappelle? David Chappelle was pointing out how, how there was a contradiction there and like what we oh. emphasize. Um, okay. I, I guess I could. I've thought about cancel culture quite a bit and I, I think it's, it's because we live in such a comfortable time right now. I think you would know about this doing jujitsu is like, we go, we, we need to like have some sort of controlled failure in our life. We need to get just uncomfortable because it's very good for us to be uncomfortable. We grow through discomfort mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> we're, we're living in a time where we don't have to worry about survival. Mo most of us, you know, we have electricity, we're not scared where, about where our next meal is going to come from. And if you're not worried about survival, then you're going to go to the next level of your being. And that's the psychological realm. And you're going to worry about something bothers you psychologically. That's going to be the equivalent of something like a saber toothed tiger attacking you in the wild. You know, now there's no more saber toothed tigers in the wild. So we find a saber toothed tiger in the form of a comment that bothers us online. And, you know, we can't, we don't know what to do with it, but hundred percent. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, just to kind of add on to what you're saying, the way I kind of view it is like, you know, these survival instincts such as like fear or, um, maybe shame and guilt, but fear is like a big one. Anger. It, it's like emotions are almost some of the most primitive like forms that we have. And like with our brain, you know, expanding as quickly as it did, it's almost like, and then not to mention the technology around us expanding at relatively the same rate as our brain did. It's that combination, I think, of, 
you know, not being able to overcome psychologically our emotions or understanding what our emotions are trying to convey to us, which as, if anyone's listened to this podcast before, meditate, <laughs> because that's where you can really come in tune with the, those uh, emotions and realize like, oh, it's because of this. But then when someone in the outside world says something that, and I haven't seen the special, but just theoretically isn't even homophobic, they're going to try to, if we go back to Jordan Peterson, you try to twist it to fit your narrative because that it makes you safe in being like angry, right? It's like, it, it, there's that like trigger. It's like that trigger event that then you're like, okay, well that made me mad and I feel safe. It, it would make me feel safe to call this person out and then put myself above them in a way. Yeah. We, at the very fabric of our being, we have this need to kind of um, demonize the other and so we can feel more morally superior. It's like in our tribal nature and yeah. um, you can split it up in any category you, you possibly want. And this could explain why we're so divided right now. <clears throat> but uh, a lot of the things that these great philosophers say is, is there is no such thing as evil out there and you're not always on the side of good. You know, oftentimes people who thought they were the goodest people on earth did the worst possible things. You know, like Hitler right. and, and Mao and Stalin, they had all these uh, propaganda campaigns that they were going to create a utopia and look at the devastation that they created. Right. So, you know, it's, it's, you can't just say that there's perpetrators out there and that you're always a victim and you're always on the side of good because that can get dangerous pretty quickly. And I think it's even difficult to define what is good. And this is something I've even seen in, you know, this whole, and <laughs> this comment might split the room here, but I remember when, you know, people say, oh, well, for it's for the betterment of society or it's for the something with good. The it's common good. The common good. That's the phrase. Like to oh, me, well, that's, uh, that's Hitler's, one of his mottos was the common oh, really? good before the individual good. No, well, I mean, there you go. There you have there you it. Go. I, and, but see, to me, it's like, I barely know what's good. I mean, first of all, I'm not even sure if there's a difference between good and bad. There's a really good uh, Chinese proverb about the farmer. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, where he like has his son. Yeah. You, you, uh, I did oh, a video on it. Oh, did you? With right, Alan perfect. Watts. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I love that story. It, but... So do I. And so it, it, So we'll just leave it at that. Go click the link below and listen to uh, <laughs> the Chinese farmer. Um, but I think it perfectly highlights, like, first of all, is there even a good or bad out of any situation? And then the second thing is, is like, how do I know if I'm doing is even good or bad for myself? And then on top of that, you want me to make a decision for the entire community, even though I'm not sure which way, I'm not even sure if there is good or bad. So for you to tell me this is for the common good, I'm like, man, like, I don't, I, I'm still at the good or bad. So <laughs> help me out there. Yeah, first. You know, it, it got me thinking to go back to Hitler. You know, we, you hear the Hitler's name and you automatically think, okay, evil guy, terrible. Sure. And this, this is going to be a nuanced point here, but up until, you know, you don't get like gas chambers and concentration camps overnight. You know, it took a long, long process to get there. Years and years. And if you look at the way Hitler was viewed, not just in Germany, but across the world, he was seen as really good. Mm -hmm. um, Germany was very prosperous. There were all these inventions and innovations that we use today it came out of Germany. Um, we're still using medicine and stuff that, that they developed. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, he, he was the Time Magazine Man of the Year in right. 1938. Like, he was celebrated. And then, you know, he did this horrible thing. Yes, uh, we're going to look at him as very evil now. But I'm sure in, in a period of time, you know, maybe a couple of generations from now, people, somebody will write a book or make a movie about all the good that came from Hitler. All, you know, he changed the world in some way. Like we, we I'm probably not making this point very well, but like, no, we look I back at like very old, like I think the emotional trauma from Hitler is still here. So you know, we're still feeling, but if we go really back to the past, like, like Genghis Khan, he killed like 20 million people. Sure. But we often see, we often like 
look at all the things that Genghis Khan did and, and say, wow, he changed the world in this way. And he opened up all these trade routes and wow, the world wouldn't be this way without him. And so we kind of forget about all the horrible things that he did. And we're now more just like astonished with like what a profound character in history he is. I mean, and I think, and this is an idea that I've, I've got, I think partially from Jordan Peterson is, you know, I, I've always like kind of had this argument with people whenever I have this good and bad conversation is, you know, pick any event, no matter how bad it is. And I'll try to figure out a good way around it. And the number one thing that usually comes up is like Hitler's Germany. And I've thought about it for a while and I kind of tied in what Jordan Peterson talks about with like the 19th century being the or 20th century being the, like the bloodiest, like the most deaths ever. And I believe that the good that came out of all that is we hopefully, or we're supposed to at least realize if you go too far right, think Hitler, or if you go too far left, think Stalin or Genghis Khan, you end up killing millions of people. And so I, I think that that should like, it's I, don't get me wrong. It's terrible that that many people had to die for us to realize this, but moving forward, like we're only having more people on earth. Technology is only getting more advanced. It's going to be a more efficient way to kill people. So in my mind, it's like, okay, we should probably learn that lesson that if you go too far to the right or too far to the left, like millions die. And in the future, it could be billions if we don't, you know, come together on that lesson. That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're at a point where our technologies, it's too good. So the, if there was a war, it'd, it'd just be too damaging. You know, with with one press of a button, you could eliminate a whole country. It's it's right. too much power. It's a lot, man. It's you know, and which should hopefully <laughs> lead credence to people not getting radicalized, right? And then this almost comes back to our earlier conversation of we need to, I guess, at an individual level, start overcoming our emotions or like our fears. Of like. I remember when would it have been maybe like five months ago, <clears throat> it was probably when I quit my job. Yeah. It was when I quit my job, like four months ago. And I remember like something that was keeping me from quitting my job was the fear of like not having money, the fear of, well, what am I going to do? Or what is this going to happen? Or what's going to be the, and I kind of went down the whole rabbit hole. And at the end of it was, well, you can't make decisions based off of fear because you're just going to sacrifice yourself your emotions, you're going to sacrifice your well-being, And then that's going to have a ripple effect on the people around you. Because if you're not happy, I mean, you're not going to be adding to the people that are around you that are happy. And so I came to this realization, it was the scariest, but I was so, so energized whenever I did it, there's like this alignment that just came within me that I was like, all right, like, I'm afraid of shit to do this, but it like means I need to do it. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's brilliant. And it's funny when you, when you actually just, the fear of your fear is much worse than just experiencing the fear. <laughs> so like if a lot of, a lot of our fears are, is uh, losing our job and becoming broke. Well, you know, if you think that through, what would you do if you were actually broke? You know, you could go live on a beach in Costa Rica for like a dollar a day and surf and eat fruit off the trees and just like work at a, like a little surf shack or something. It doesn't sound that bad. I mean, you it's know? funny you say that because I'm in Brazil where it's like super cheap. I mean, that's part of the reason I'm here. And there was literally like a fruit tree <laughs> where I saw this girl like just picking fruit off a tree. And I'm like, and I'm like, what are you doing with that? She's like, I'm eating it. And I'm like, I was like, shit, like, you know, to your point, like you don't even, you know, like, what do we need in life? Like, all we really need is food and shelter. And then everything else is kind of made up at that point. Yeah. When you travel around the world, you'll meet tons of people who kind of just face that fear and completely left society. And it, they, they live out in the middle of nowhere in all sorts of different ways. And now with the internet, you can be like a coder out there. So there's all these expats that are making tons of money in USD and then spending it in another currency. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was kind of one of my uh, philosophies. It's the, and the, it's the Brazilian Hey Al. It's like make USD spend Hey Al. Cause it's like, they, the the <laughs> transfer is just so crazy. Like the the currency shift, like it's like five or six to one. And then you get to experience all this other culture. You get to learn a new language. 
you get to see how other people and, and so you grow as well it's like cheaper to live you grow and it's you know it's like everything kind of just all into it and it like it was like it, it was enough that was enough for me at least to kind of get over that fear you know that's awesome and then once you you take on that that risk you're, you're not afraid to take other risks you know once you experience your worst fears you're like oh that's as bad as you can get all right, right. You know, i have no fear to like start that company now and you know invest everything into this idea so you're right especially if you kind of believe in it like you were saying earlier about how it was just like doing it for yourself almost as opposed to doing it for other people right because there's a mm -hmm. level of like you know and i'm pulling this from my personal life now it's like you know i have x dollars that i plan to you know have and i want to get like a stable business going on um you know stable passive stream of income going and it's like well at the end of that <clears throat> at the end of that road like what's the worst case scenario and i realized that it was like move back in with my parents and i like had a resistment to that and i realized that it was like a culture thing because like nobody wants to be a 27 28 year old kid moving back in with their parents to start a business it's like you know societally speaking and so it's like well why am i sacrificing what i internally want travel the world, start my own business for society. Because I was a software engineer and I remember I was a software engineer who worked on like remotely piloted aircrafts. And so when I would tell people that it'd be like, oh wow, like that's super cool. And, but like internally I'm thinking to myself like, yeah, but like it, it's cool for other people to hear it. But for me, I'm like, yeah, but if you knew what I did day to day, it's awful, like, you know? And so it, it, it hit that breaking point with me. So how's the podcast going? <laughs> uh, dude, I love it. I mean, it, yeah. you know, I just, I love having, you know, these deep conversations with people. And that's really what got me into it was I started connecting with people on these, these ideas that you kind of promote on your, uh, on your channel as well, where I'm just like, guys, there's, there's more to this. Like, and so that just got me energized to have these conversations. And so then it was, uh, let's start recording them. And, I honestly didn't even have a monetization strategy. And then it kind of just has been slowly developing into like a, like a and coaching thing and still working on all that aspect of it. But right now I'm still just kind of like you. I mean, I just kind of relieved to hear you say, it. it's like, just do it for yourself and, you know, worry about, you know, I'll worry about the money you yeah. know, whenever I run out. <clears throat> that's a, that's a great way of approaching it. And like, I, I just got wrote down real quick because I got reminded of like, when I was at the beginning of my, my YouTube channel, like I wasn't maybe getting the views and the money, but it was exciting. Cause it was like, I was in the unknown and everything was like, I was trying to figure things out. And whenever something worked, it was really exciting because you're kind of yeah. like, <clears throat> um, it's really unpredictable and you, you don't want things to be predictable. You really want a surprise. Like if you think about, the happiest you get it's when your you, your team is about to lose the game and some suddenly they win and it's a huge surprise you know it's not as you don't get the same rush when um your team just rolls steam rolls a team and you're like okay you know i thought that was going to happen that was yeah. a good win yeah you know? yeah no i know exactly what you're talking <clears throat> so, about my yeah hey, go ahead i was just gonna say like um so one thing that was really helpful in the beginning of my youtube career is i, I was fortunate that i was up in the bay area so I was able to go to the YouTube headquarters occasionally and not in the beginning, but once I had like a channel over a hundred thousand subscribers, they okay. will allow you to come to certain events at YouTube. So I, I started going there and I'd always want to know like what the secrets were, you know, what are the hacks and the tips to, to grow faster and make a better channel. And I was always frustrated because like I would always get the same answer from all the coders, all the marketing people in YouTube, they would always say it's consistency. And I'm like, you know, I want a sexy tip yeah. on how to grow fast. And they always would like, you know, just be consistent. And I thought about that and like, it's, it isn't sexy, but that is the secret to just building an audience, building trust, building a business is you just have to like show up and, and be consistent. And, you know, like, let's say I, I posted, video and it did really well and then i just disappeared for a year and then i posted three more videos and then i just disappeared for a year um but but putting the videos out i i put the video out 
I put about a video out every other Tuesday for the last five years straight, four years straight. And I haven't missed a Tuesday. Nice. And like, you know, being a YouTuber, you can upload a video whenever you want. Right. Um, there's no boss telling you when to do it, but I've made it like my own creed to just, you are going to upload every Tuesday and you are not going to miss a Tuesday. So now <clears throat> I feel like that's one of the best ways to build trust with an audience. People that you don't know is they know that, okay, it's Tuesday at this time after school video going to come out. And so I've kind of taken that philosophy and I've applied it to a bunch of different things like the Instagram. I'm like, okay, every morning at 5 a.m., you're going to get an Instagram post. And yeah. I've kind of committed to that. And the funny thing is you, you don't think people care. You're like, all right, you know, if I miss a day, who cares? But I get met. If I miss a day, I, I hear people like, where's the <laughs> post today? <And> so like, <laughs> you can only miss so many days before people start to kind of like drop Fall off, off and forget yeah. about you. So, I mean, that's, I mean, that's cool. That, that probably also validates the consistency aspect. If you like miss a day and people are like, dude, what are you doing? Like, are you still alive? Like, <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's kind of like climbing a ladder. Like you think about Joe Rogan, like he didn't even, he, when he started his podcast, he was like, all right, I'm just going to have fun in my living room. Right. And then he's like, this was fun. And then he did, he kept doing them though. And then eventually he got like some good authors on there and it started growing. And then, you know, it took seven years to get to Elon Musk sitting in a nice studio. But if you keep marching forward, Little by little, right. it's inevitable that you will succeed or you will keep progressing. Yeah. And I think, um, <clears throat> cause I've tried multiple different, let's say content creation ideas. And I always hit a, a phase of burnout where like I would create all this stuff and like just be posting it all the time. And I hit that certain point of just like, I I'm done, like I'm over it. And so what I've kind of realized, I think with this essentially is like, it's gotta be something that you're like into. Right. And I think your story also leads credence to it, where it's like, it's something that you really need to be, it needs to resonate with your soul almost that you're selfishly doing it for yourself. And it's like, you know, this is for nobody else except for me. And I enjoy this stuff and I'm putting it out there because in, I don't know, 10 years, I want to show this to my kids or something, or I want to be able to look at this if I ever want to look at it, you know? And then, you know, like you said, just doing it every single day and, you know, keeping it up. And I think that because the sound of that, right? If you say you have to do this every single day for the rest of, let's say your life, you know, there's anxiety that comes with that. But if it resonates with you and it's like, yes, like I could do this every single day, then it's, then it's not even, it's not even an issue. It just is. Yeah. There's a, there's a principle I talk about quite a bit called Ikigai. It's the Japanese um, model for how to find your purpose in life, but you have the four circles. I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, you have maybe. Um, one circle is what you're good at. Another circle is what you love doing. And then another circle is what does the world need? And last circle is what will you get paid to do? So you can kind of step back and make a list. Okay. What do I love doing? Okay. If I love it, I'm not going to, I'm not going to quit. Um, if I'm good at it or, you know, if I love it, I'm not going to be miserable. If I'm good at it, I'm not going to quit. If it's something that the world needs, I'll kind of have that sense of fulfillment. Like there's plenty right. of bankers who make a lot of money who, um, are I'm good at what so. they're doing, but they, they feel empty inside. You know, I talked to, to people who make a lot of money, quite a bit and they feel like they're missing something and it's not the money. Right. And then I have a, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, just the last thing is like, it's pretty encouraging that, you know, if you figure out those three circles, you can pretty much figure out a way to get, make money off of anything. Like you could juggle balls of yarn yeah. and you could, you could, you could figure out a way to get paid to do that. Sometimes people need it. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe you teach other people, right? Like, and I think that's kind of, it's so interesting to hear you say that because it really feels like that's kind of how this is my things like all been transforming almost because it's like, it started like, all right, what am I good at? And what do I, or what do I love to do? What was it? Love to do good at. What, what does the world need? And what does the world need? What people pay you for? And what people pay you for. So I guess I saw, I saw the first three things, right? Which was, you know, I love having these deep conversations. I, I mean, 
the fact that I enjoy having them, I feel like it also makes me good at them. And then the next level of it is like, I feel like the world needs it sort of like with your YouTube channel is like, I feel like that's stuff that this world needs, at least at this time, especially in this time where we're so confused, so disorientated, so fractured. And then, you know, I think now, like at least where I'm at in the whole process of this is figuring out that last component is like, how do you get paid for it? Like, what's the, what's the at, like end of the tunnel? I've been looking into like sales funnels and stuff, but you know, I haven't like pushed it too hard because I don't want to like force it, you know, but you know, to your point, it's just like, I, I totally resonate. That sounds like a, a really cool um, Japanese thing, thing that the yeah. Japanese figured out. <laughs> Yeah, I was just I just had a conversation right before this podcast. I, I was in a boxing class and then after the class ended, this guy was like, Oh, what do you what do you do for work? And I'm like, Oh, I'm a YouTuber. And he's like, Whoa, that's crazy. And then I'm like, Well, what do you do? He's like, I'm a baker. Yeah. I could never, you know, I could never like do what you do. And I'm like, actually, I mean, I kind of just pointed out like, dude, do you flip on a camera and you say, This is how to make the best chocolate chip cookie on earth and you make a really simple video that gets traction soon you're having, you have cookbook, you know, right. who knows, you know, there's so many avenues on how to get this stuff out there, especially with the internet now. And I think a lot of people are realizing that. And that's why in America, at least I've been kind of keeping an eye on this. People are not going back to work. You know, we had the pandemic, everybody couldn't work and now everything's open, but they're having a lot of trouble getting people to go back to work. And I think during this lockdown period, a lot of people realize like what is their purpose in life and you know they they kind of did some soul searching and yeah. they had a chance to kind of just pause which was great for the, the whole world like we were saying about you don't know if anything's good or bad pandemic seemed bad but you know a lot of people are discovering their like true nature and who they are and uh they don't want to go back and work at mcdonald's and i just saw a thing mcdonald's is trying to hire like little kids like 14 year olds that's their solution because they can yeah. get people to work. And it's like, you know, people are figuring it out that it's not, you know, that there's more to life than just soul crushing job. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, right? Like, yeah, I mean, it definitely amplifies the whole good and bad. I remember having a lot of conversations with people when it's like, oh, how was like the pandemic treating you? And I remember the first month was awful because like the gyms were shut down. Jiu-Jitsu was shut down. I remember that being awful just from like a physical standpoint. Cause I couldn't move. I couldn't sweat after I got that cleared up. And then it became like, it became pretty good quick. Like I tried doing a couple of startups. Like I started figuring out some different stuff. Like, you know, it was getting away from that whole, you know, model of industry that you realize like, Oh, there's, you can find good in everything if you're kind of looking for it. Um, yeah, and then I don't. Yeah, I, don't remember. <clears throat> I discovered all these weird, new things about myself during the pandemic. Like I used to go out and socially like drink, probably once a week, and I never like I I always didn't like drinking. I always felt terrible on it. And then the pandemic happened, and I just haven't really drank since it started. I have yeah. I probably drank once since it started, and I have no interest in in going back to it. I've got nice. <clears throat> more independent just. Um, set up a whole mushroom growing operation in my closet. Hey, <laughs> That's a new development. I love it, dude. Um, World needs picked more up on mushrooms. Some, yeah, picked up <laughs> on some little hobbies and just, I, I think I've become a little bit more of a hermit. And yeah. the pandemic was, was great for introverts. And I, I consider myself to be pretty introverted. So I was like, I had never put out so many, so many videos. Uh, I had like a backlog of videos, you know, a surplus. And I almost had too much stuff to put out. <laughs> I mean, that's a good problem. That's a good problem to have as a creator. Yeah, and I almost feel a little guilty because, you know, the the traffic on YouTube just took off when the pandemic. Like, you can literally see when like the lockdown started. It's uh, just like right. things started going up, and you know, I felt bad because everybody's like saying how how awful. You know, my friends like my biz, my my restaurants closed, uh, and, oh, dude. But then I'm thinking, boy, this pandemic keeps going. I'm gonna like, yeah. <laughs> You know, of course you want it to end for sure. Right. And you, I feel horrible for all those businesses that have closed, but there on the other side, there's people making all sorts of crazy money off of like NFTs and all these new things have opened up. Right. I mean, hopefully people have more time to do research, do soul searching, 
you know, figure all that stuff out. I guess we're kind of at a point now where it's like, we're kind of adjusted to it almost. Like it's, I feel like it's still kind of loosened up a bit, you know? I mean, I guess it depends what part of the country you're in. Um, I mean, I know San Diego, whenever I left, it was pretty good in most areas where people were pretty like, all right, like, yeah, it's cool. Like whatever, we're over it, you know? Um, but it, 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 and it's so bizarre. It's like, like, I remember someone actually in jujitsu today in Porto Alegre was talking to me about the homeless situation in LA. He was like, Oh, I was just seeing on the news that like LA's homeless is so bad. And I was like, first of all, <laughs> I didn't even know that. I mean, like I knew that, but like the fact that you're getting that information is pretty crazy. But then like the extra level to it is like, it comes back to that good versus bad. It's like, like, it's terrible that that happened, but like the good is that I hope people realize like that these, I don't know. I, I don't want to make it political. I feel like the extreme policies kind of like hurt small businesses. I don't know if that's a political comment or not anymore, but you know, I feel like hopefully that opens our eyes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's hard to say anything that's not political now. Yeah. But, <laughs> just um, saying like, yeah, just talking about this makes it political. <laughs> Well, I don't think it's up for debate that the homeless problem is crazy in LA. Like I drove through Skid Row and yeah. I could not believe it. It was like endless, just like tents. They had taken over like an entire neighborhood and the living conditions are, are just like, you can't even fathom it. It's like something from the Black Plague really? 1300 years ago or something. You have people with, yeah, it's, it's bad. It's like, I go up to Oregon sometimes and my, my grandma's up there and she's always complaining about all the homeless in Oregon. And it'll be like one hippie with like bongos <laughs> with some dreadlocks. And I'm like, this is not a home. This is not bad. <laughs> you come to LA and it's, <laughs> yeah. it's next level. It's like zombie apocalypse. That's crazy. To me, it's crazy you make that connection to like the Black Plague or like zombie apocalypse. Because to me, like those are, it, it, so let's, let me take a step back here. Right. We're talking about a time that we feel like we live in where we have like the most security, the most all this stuff. And we make these problems out of nothing. But then, you know, you look down a street and we have the Black Plague or like the zombie apocalypse, per se, where it's like all these people are being put out. I don't want to say disenfranchised because I don't know all their situations, but at least like put into this these terrible conditions for whatever reason might be. And so it's like huh, I don't know how I'm trying to like work this back in. Well, it's, it's such a multifaceted problem. It seems like you've got on one side, you've got this financial issue with great wealth disparity in our country and kind of like automation and, and people are getting pushed out of just being needed. They're kind of becoming disposable. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, the mental health aspect, which probably stems from like childhood trauma and you know, that manifests later in addiction and addiction is a huge part of that. You know, I, I'd say I can't generalize, but a lot of the addicts are addicted to something and sure. that seems to keep them imprisoned. And that becomes a vicious cycle in itself where, you know, I call it the, uh, the shameless effect. Have you ever seen shameless? I've seen a few episodes. Uh, so you might yeah. get the core concept where anytime, first of all, it's just, anyone that doesn't know it's essentially just a family of kids who just keep making bad decisions after bad decisions. Like you, it starts to make mm -hmm. you anxious with how bad the decisions they make are. Um, but once they like, they end up going to jail or they end up losing a thousand dollars. The mindset is always, well, I'm a Gallagher and Gallagher is like their last name. I'm a Gallagher. So it's supposed to happen to me. It's like, Oh, well, this is supposed to happen to me. And it's like, it's like that repetitive nature in your brain where it's like, you just keep feeding it the same information of, well, I'm supposed to be poor. Well, I'm supposed to go to jail. It's like, you know, it's like the whole it's manifestation. It's when you want to see a red car, you're going to see a red car. And then that whole process just keeps compounding on yourself. And if you haven't gone into, like you were saying, like your trauma from your childhood and really evaluate it, then how it, it becomes very difficult to ever break that cycle and to move on from it. Yeah. It's <clears throat> the homeless whole, whole issue. It, it's, it's impossible to generalize what the problem is. Um, sure. And I, it's hard to say how that's good though, but it's, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. 
it, it's a big it's issue in California. Yeah, because it's hard to look at it, right? I mean, I, I don't know. Well, and, I guess it's easy to like say how this is affecting me. Oh, you know, they're they're making my street dirty, and I don't like the way this looks. And these people are a problem to be solved. You know, we, a lot of big issues in the world look at humans as the problem to be solved. And uh, I, I'm very like pro-human. I, I like to, I believe in the best in, in humanity, and I, I'm. I'm not even like, I just made a video about how a uh, sperm count is plummeting. Um, I saw that. And yeah, like fertility is dropping and the, the reaction from everybody was, oh, good. Yeah. Less humans. Awesome. And I, I really thought about this. I'm like, you know, is this good? Or like, what does this mean? If, if the population, if we're seeing this trend where we're, we're on a bell curve and over the 1900s, we were accelerating in population growth a lot and I can it's a long story about that but basically we just made we industrialized and infant mortality was super low so all the babies were surviving now and uh, healthcare got better and life span got longer but now we're at a time when a lot of lifestyle choices people are waiting way later in life to have kids and a lot are choosing not to have kids because they don't want to bring people into this world but the population is still growing now but it's the growth is much, much slower. And if it follows this trend that it's on, it'll hit 9 billion in about 20 years, and then it'll plummet. It'll drop probably faster than it rose. Yeah, because I is, think- Yeah, I think you were- This is already happening. Yeah, 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 because I think in that video, you were talking about how it's like an hourglass. Is it talk about how it's like an hourglass shape right now, where it's like all, all the people that are alive are like super young or super old. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you kind of have that essentially like an hourglass where it's then like you're saying, everyone's just going to die and fall off. And then it's like, okay, well, what happens if you, I guess, have an inverted hourglass almost like what, what do we do in that situation? You know, where, yeah. Well, in the video, it, you want your population to be like a pyramid, um, right. where you have a little bit of old people on top and then you have a lot of workforce and then you have the most kids, the, and uh, what's happening now is nobody's having kids, so there's no bottom. And then you have this like kind of bulge that you have a lot of old people. And uh, I don't know. A lot of people are saying that's great, you know, less people. But I'm trying to think of like, is it really good? Like, you know, maybe it's it's good for the environment, but I'm the, just yeah. yeah best, I wonder. The best thing I could think of is I think that humans are very, I mean, on this planet, I guess, without a doubt, we're the best at adapting to our environment, right? And maybe, you know, maybe at some level, humanity needs to cap off at 9 billion people. And then maybe there will be like a little bit of an adjustment period, and then it'll stay steady. Maybe, maybe then it'll become more of like a tower where it'll, you know, then, I don't know, like, you know, two people will only have two kids, you know, I, I guess, I don't know. I'm just speculating here that maybe, maybe from an adaptation point of view, we need it to cap off. Like it's hard to know. Yeah. yeah. It's really hard to know. But I mean, I guess if you got rid of like 80% of the people on earth, you know, you look around if 80% of the people that you know, or look up to are gone. That's no Steve jobs. That's no Elon right. Musk, no Jordan Peterson. A lot of the, the greatness of humanity is gone. Well, in that, and, yeah. And then in that situation, I think we would have to adapt and start having kids more. Right. I think if, if we were to, hmm. let's say if even 50%, right. Say we go back, I don't know what time period it was when we only had 3 billion people on earth. Are you familiar with that? Was it like the 1900s? Uh, I think that was probably a very, that was probably during the, the ascension. Right? Okay. Okay. So, so, so in hypothetically speaking, and I don't, I'm just thinking this off the top of my head, let's say half the population is wiped out. I just saw a movie that was talking about that idea. And like that would force us if we're going to adapt, like we need more people. So in my mind, that's going to force us to, this might get a little graphic here, but impregnate as many women as possible and then we'll probably have to go back to the gender stereotypes that we went through before, right? So that they, so now that we have this like divide between males and females, right? Because we're kind of 
in the way I'm seeing it is we're kind of coming to a, a head point where we're kind of almost getting rid of polarity between mm. the genders. And so, you know, maybe that has a level of it. And, you know, it's a part of the adaptation process that human life is going through. That is a really interesting point. And I, I've seen experiments where they put like mice or rats in a very clustered environment. And uh, they tend to mimic like human behavior a little bit. They become homosexual. They lose interest in breeding. And even if you give all these mice as much food as they want and you make like their little home like a utopia, they tend to like lose interest in like reproducing. Really? So perhaps that is a natural way of just capping off. Right. It's like realizing like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that, that video I just made got a huge response from, I, I didn't jump to any conclusions. It was kind of just presenting the evidence of what is happening. And, but everybody kind of made up their own conclusion and, and the conclusions were, were pretty, a lot of people thought depopulation was great. A lot of people thought that this explained the whole transgender movement. Interesting. I wouldn't dare to comment on that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not when you're just getting your face out there. <laughs> no, I, I'm not. I'm not as powerful as Dave Chappelle, so yeah. I couldn't withstand the uh, the mob. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, I've said, and probably not. I, I don't think I've touched on transgenders on this podcast, but you have definitely approached some uh, controversial topics, and I haven't really gotten any hate mail yet. But who knows? It's still young, so. You know, I wouldn't dare even talk about it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's fine. We could we can sidestep that one. Yeah. Um, but I, here's here's what I'll say. I, maybe again, it's a part of that ability to explore, right? Because if we only had a billion people on Earth, right? Let's let's talk about the time when um, losing my train of thought. Let's talk about the time whenever you know, it was chastised like by the Christian church and it was chastised by society to be even just gay. Like that's a huge like thing we've come across in the last 10, 20 years was like the, just being gay alone has like been so welcome in society in the last 20 years. It's insane. But hypothetically speaking, if we're running off of my uh, theory of earlier, if you keep going back in time, right. And we only have a billion people then it's not in the best interest of society for us to have gay people because they're not reproducing. So therefore they're not going to be contributing to us needing to grow our pop, <clears throat> grow our population. In to survive. Yeah. 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 And so, mm -hmm. you know, now that we have so much abundance, so much wealth, so much free time, a part of that time is probably exploring our own sexuality and our own human nature and like, okay, well, is this me or is society hmm. imposing this on me? So like, which, where am I going to kind of fall on this idea? Yeah. So I'll say something so I don't get canceled. I'll say a good side <laughs> of this. <laughs> um, I think it is good that, that like the rigid gender identification is getting eroded away in, in, a, in a sense. Cause like, we identify so strongly with our gender from like birth. Uh, I was just listening to a book by Eckhart Tolle, a new, a new earth. And he was talking about this, how, you know, if we want to separate ourselves from our ego, we can tap into like a higher consciousness. And one big part of that is kind of like, he was encouraged by how people are kind of like separating from the traditional gender roles. And I, I think that's good. Like there's, I'm learning about like, the more feminine side of spirituality right now. And, you know, for, <clears throat> for the last few years, I've been really into like the ancient civilizations, the geometry, the geology, the Atlantis type stuff, uh, that side of spirituality. And, um, my girlfriend right now, she's, she's super into like crystals and psychic stuff and healing energy and, um, tarot, so I'm kind of like, you know, that's something I don't know anything about. And uh, I feel completely comfortable looking into it. <laughs> but but a lot of my guy friends are like, psychic? The hell? Like, <laughs> crystals? So why are you got a crystal on your desk? <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> hey, man, dude, I, I, know yeah. exact, I know exactly what you're kind of going through, man. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's really fascinating. I, yeah, because, like, there's so many ideas that I want to share with other guys in a sense that, like, I just know, 
and maybe it's me imposing it, but part of it is like, I've been there and it's like, okay, crystals don't really have those prop. It's like, okay, but you're putting your trust in a crystal. And then, you know, I've had my doubts in the past. It's like, well, how much of it is just, if you want to believe it, then it's true, you know, or even astrology for that matter with the whole Mercury's and retrograde kind of thing, which I'm pretty sold on is a real thing, <laughs> but whether or not that's real is beside the point, right? It's, it's those ideas that I guess are considered more feminine by nature. And this even, you know, to tie it back in, it's like being able to, you know, it's, it's the polarity, right? Like masculine versus feminine polarity. It's like, and, and I've been exper I've been paying attention to this a lot with like, in regards to relationships where if you want a more feminine woman, you have to be more masculine because then it, 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 it creates that polarity in your relationship such that it occurs. But I think, and this is where I'm trying to get to is kind of, let's say conquering polarity or rising above polarity where it's like, okay, there's, I can be balance is a weird word, but I can have both energies within me and understand, you know, let's say when to use which one, do I need to be more masculine in this situation? Do I need to be more feminine in this situation? And it's almost like overcoming polarity, which I think mm -hmm. is evident in a lot more things mm -hmm. than just relationships, but I think relationships is a lens into the idea. Yeah. I think that, and that might be the way forward with all our world problems. It's just, um, the polarity is not outside us. It's within us. Like you're not good and they're not evil. You have the capability to be good and evil within each one of us have that capacity within our hearts. And, um, so it, it takes like, if we can look within and just start to recognize, um, our own contradictions and our own ego identifications, we can kind of rise above it. And instead of having to pick a side, you kind of just observe and you make your own side. You're right. And, and quite frankly, I'm in my mind, I'm relating this back to the whole conversation we had with the 20th century, where it's like, you go too far left, millions die, you go too far right, millions die. So why not conquer both of those polarities and bring it more to the middle to kind of have like a more rationalized and understanding approach to politics. But <laughs> I know that there's a lot of fear and emotion tied to that conversation as well. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I made a video about mass psychosis that earlier this year. Oh, that I love it really well. Yeah. I think that might be my favorite uh, episode that you've made. Thanks. And yeah. I, I tried to stay extremely neutral on that topic. And it's funny because uh, Trump supporters think that that video is about the liberal media and all that. And liberals think it's about Trump supporters and you know, everybody thinks it's about the other side, but them, you know, I've read probably thousands of comments yeah. that all say this. And it, it just made me realize like, it's so easy to see the faults in others. Very hard to see the faults in our own. I just saw a passage from, from the Bible. Uh, Jesus said, well, um, why do you see the speck in my eye, but not the log in your own? <clears throat> and, you know, we go out and we try to fix other people before, you know, looking within. Right. So, yeah, no. And I think there's profound knowledge in that for sure. I, I think that's hilarious because I think it was pretty neutrally um, done because I remember, I, I think you started off talking about the, like the, uh, I guess the slave class or the worker class who's under the tyrants. And I was like, oh yeah, now he's going to roast like the tyrants. And then you kind of went through it and I was like sitting there like, holy shit, like, this makes sense. Like this makes sense why they think what they're thinking and doing what they're doing. Like it totally makes sense that like it creates this polarity in us where we're like subservient, subserviently giving away our rights, let's say, or our free will to other people. And it ties back of course to fear and other emotions of, you know, being scared and all this other stuff. And then why they think they can rule the world. And I was like, Holy shit. Like, I remember that was a video that I had to like take a second afterwards. And I was like, damn, like I had to send that to quite a few people like, Hey dude, check this out. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, where was I going with that? I was going somewhere with that. Well, that video was insane. Cause I saw a lot of people like that were pretty liberal sharing it. Tons of people. Yeah. And then, you know, Alex Jones shared it and oh, he, yeah. he did an entire episode about that one video. He had a, he does like a three hour show every day. 
Yeah. And he dedicated a whole hour to talking about that video. And then he showed the whole video in its entirety on his show. And then somebody's like, yo, you're out, you're on Alex Jones. And I'm like, huh? And then I, he like sends me the video and like, he's like talking about my channel for a while. And I'm like, this is kind of like, again, I don't know, is this good or bad? Cause like, I'm thrilled by this shout out yet. Right. He, he actually apologized on his show. He's like, look, I don't want to get them in trouble by like, um, praising them so much. Like associating. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so of course, like, I posted that I posted a little thing on Instagram that Alex Jones gave me that shout out and I stayed very neutral. I didn't say like, this is awesome. I didn't say this is terrible, but like, you know, I just kind of watched the comments just blow up. Like, and I'd say 95% of people thought it was cool that he did that shout out. And then there's a couple that are like, thought I was like a Sandy hook denier now. Or something. <laughs> Comes with the territory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, yeah, yeah, that was and in his shout out, he was like, "I sent it to Trump, I sent it to Joe Rogan, Tucker Carlson," and I'm like, "Jeez!" And I, I'm I'm pretty sure Joe Rogan watched it, so because he well, was I mean, talking because, about it the next day. Oh uh, yeah, and then I mean, he also was. I mean, you've reached out to him, of course, about like you know stuff that he said, right? Like, and you've done videos over him, so I'm sure he's like at least been like vaguely familiar with like your your work and all that. You know, before that. Yeah. Occasionally he shared shared a video. Yeah, that but, was it. Yeah. You know, now he's like untouchable. He's so Yeah. Yeah. He's at that level now where it's just like uh so Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty crazy too, right? It goes back to the the levels of fans. And speaking of, like I'm super grateful that you're here, by the way. I don't know if I super thankful, super grateful. Like Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really loving yeah. this conversation. And appreciate it. Yeah, dude. I mean Welcome anytime. Uh, but yeah, it's like, and this is something I'm trying to figure out myself where it's like, what's the level of like people I reach out to, you know, it's like, you know, I, <laughs> I sent a message to, uh, Jordan Peterson, obviously he never got back to me or anything. Of course, like I didn't expect him to, but it's like, you know, okay, well, okay. There's the top, like, all right. So now let's start like, kind of just like getting down into the middle of like, you know, who, who has the time, but like, you know, isn't, well, this, this is, is definitely tough, your starting right? point right here. This is, yeah. you can't go any lower than me. So yeah. now it's all, it's all up from here. I have to go above from here. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, dude, I, I, I mean, I see you as being like pretty figured it out. I don't want to say figured it out. That's a weird, always a weird uh, conversation, but like a pretty established person, you know? Well, it's you... Fun, that's funny that you say that. Cause like we all, I have this imposter syndrome occasionally. Like yeah. I've been in a room with like a lot of other YouTubers and I'm like, Oh my God, I've watched your channel. Like, I've watched your channel. And then I'm like, your channel's amazing. And they're all like, you know, your channel's amazing. And we're like, no, no, my channel's nothing compared <laughs> to yours. Like I've been watching you for years and like, I've been watching you for years. So yeah, you, yeah it's, it's kind of funny. And then you look around and you're like, I don't know how I got here, but it's just the consistency, I guess. Yeah. You got to, I guess you got to own it. Yeah. I mean, and then, and then in my mind, there becomes a fine line between like, what would it be like kind of minimizing the ego or like needing to be aware of it kind of deal to not, cause like, I feel like once you feel like you figured everything out, that's when whatever it is, especially in jujitsu, I'll say like you want that day that you're like, Oh, I know everything, nothing more. It's like that next day in the mat, you get crushed. Like, you know, it, and I maybe I think you might have even kind of touched on it with your channel where you were like talking about how you were putting, putting out videos and then you're getting good momentum. You're like, yeah, I figured it out. And then that whole thing happened that just like kind of flipped upside down. And it's like, wow, now none of my videos are getting watched at all. And so it's like, you need yeah, to kind of it, keep that humbleness. It just gets boring. You know, if you, you keep doing the same thing. So it's fun to just mix things up. And I'm always conducting little experiments on every video. Um, and then trying to see the feedback. Um, but at this point I don't do any really big experiments. I kind of know what works, but. And you're just yeah. loving the process doing it. Yeah. Loving the process. I'm not burnt out at all. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going to do this for as long as I can. I mean, you look good. You look energized. <laughs> <laughs> so do you. Yeah, thanks, man. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, right? Like, that's the goal, right? Is to find something that you can do every single day consistently, day after day, and just 
keep enjoying it, even if nobody ever watches it. Yeah, I think I, I'm really lucky or and blessed that I'm, I'm in a situation where I'm not working on a project that's like so big that it's like a mountain in front of me. Like each video is kind of like a refreshing new start. So okay. uh, I don't, I never feel like it gets stale. Like, you know, one week I'll do Randall Carlson. We'll talk about ancient civilizations. And then the next week we'll do something on sperm count with the doctor. And then the next week we'll do Jordan Peterson psychology. And then, you know, I've kind of set it up in a way where I can really be flexible. Right. I'm glad in the beginning of the channel, I almost labeled it as a science channel and I'm so glad I didn't do that. You know, after school is such an open-ended name right? and I've, and I've allowed myself to like have anybody on the channel and, you know, I'm not limited to just whiteboard videos. I've had other animators come on and I try to just make it as fluid as, and as fun and easily to access the information as possible. Yeah. That's, it's interesting. You say like after school is kind of like an open ended name. I remember when I first found your channel, I remember thinking like, Oh, like this is all the stuff that you should know that they don't teach us in school. <laughs> like, I remember kind of being like, Oh, after school. So it's like, yeah, it's like all that information that we should know, but they're not going to teach us like in the, in the, in between the walls. Yeah. That was uh, the kind of the idea with the name is like, there's this idea that once you get out of school, you're done learning. And I kind of think that that's when learning begins. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can attest to that for, uh, a lot of stuff. I mean, especially software engineering for that matter. Like it's, I loved learning about computer engineering. I learned, lo lo I loved learning coding. I loved learning about the hardware. And then once I got put out in the real world, I was like, this isn't, this isn't the same thing, you know? Mm. And well, then, it'll probably come in handy though, to know all that stuff. Oh, for sure. Right. I mean, yeah. I, I, and it, and if we want to go back to my whole story is it certainly helped alleviate a lot of the fear. Because if I open up my inbox, I, if I open up my email, I guarantee I have probably two or three um, emails saying, hey, job position available, like urgent request it. Like, I'm sure within like a month, I could find a software engineering job, you know, because my resume or, or, is solid for, you know. Or McDonald's. They <laughs> <laughs> might be paying about the same amount by the time I get back. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's a good point. Well, I got to run here. For sure. Man. This has been awesome. Yeah, let's, uh, yeah. I'll sign you out. Uh, so guys, this was, uh, Mark, Mark Woodley, Mark Wooding, Mark, Wooding. Mark Wooding, but it doesn't Mark matter. Wooding. <laughs> oh, of course it matters, man. Um, guys, this is Mark Wooding. Uh, you know, go check out after school. It's down below. Um, so Mark, I'll definitely grab any links you want me to put below any of that stuff. Uh, is there any like comments or remarks you want to give to people before you take off? It all sounds really corny in my mind. That but, do uh, it, dude. Anything Cliches is possible. Are the best. Anything, anything is possible. If you it's can see it in your mind, you can make it a reality. The great Mark Wooden. <laughs> well, thanks, Mark. Again, I know I've said it once, but I always say it again. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. It was a pleasure. And guys, let's uh, keep growing together.